Welcome to our second lecture covering the nature of the employment relationship. As you uh, recall from the first lecture, we talked about kind of some introductory material. Um, and now we're going to dive in really to the content of the course. So we're going to reflect upon the issue of the status of the worker. When I use the term worker, this is the more generic term. We actually have two choices for the worker. If you think about that um, uh, Robert Frost poem about a meeting in a glen and uh, there were two roads and in the, in the poem he takes the one less traveled. Well, we can think about that as the employer, employee or independent contractor situation. Um, you're either, if you're a worker, you're either an employee or an independent contractor. There's no third option and it's not possible to be both. So you, you really are at a fork in the road and you have to decide, I fit into this category, we'll call this the independent, the independent contractor path, or I fit into this category, the employee path. And we're going to talk today about how to know which category you're in. So worker, for the purpose of this class, is a larger term. Worker includes employee and it in, includes independent contractor. So if we were to do a Venn diagram here, or um, here, um, we would have in this larger term, employee and independent contractor. But both of these terms mean worker. Now, in everyday conversation, probably most of us use the term worker to mean employee, but it really is the broader term when we're talking about the legal meaning of these words. Okay, so you've decided you're a small business owner and you've decided you're going to hire somebody. Uh, you need somebody to perform some labor either that you don't want to do or you don't have the skills or the time to do. And so now the first choice you have to make even before you decide whether you're going to hire Bob or Sally, um, or even maybe before you decide exactly what you need to have done, is you have to decide, do I want to make this person an employee, or do I want this person to be an independent contractor? And from this decision, lots of legal implications flow. And we'll talk about those as we go forward in this discussion. But this is a big issue um, and many employers get it wrong. Small employers get it wrong. Big employers get it wrong. Um, and if uh, you get it wrong, it can be a very, very expensive error. Um, uh, so you, you, you want to get this one right as much as possible. So how do you decide uh, which is the better path? Well, obviously, if one path were better, uh, everyone would pick that path and we wouldn't even need the second category. So as you probably surmise, there are advantages and disadvantages to both paths. And we'll talk about um, not only how to decide whether it's an independent contractor or an employee, but also talk about how you're going to fashion or uh, structure the job that you, have, you want done uh, so that it uh, maximizes the benefits to the employment situation and minimizes the risks. Um, it would be lovely if I could tell you that there is a very clear-cut, easy to apply, single rule that will answer this question for you and that you can go about your business and run your business and don't have to worry about this. Unfortunately, this is not the case. Um, while it's fraught with, with risks, very, very significant fines, even in some cases criminal prosecution can result if you do this wrong, um, it, it's not well defined, um, it's not transparent, it's not easy peasy how to decide whether that particular person who's working is an employee or an independent contractor. Let's talk in a little bit more general terms though about kind of the history of workers and how that plays out. So the first idea is, you know, well, what is an employee? I mean, we all kind of know what an employee is, at least in the everyday use of that word. Uh, one definition we sometimes see is an individual employed by an employer. I mean, that's true, but it's circular, right? I mean, 
in order to figure out what an employee is, you have to know what an employer is. And probably the definition of an employer is something like an individual who employs an employee, right? Um, there's a, you're not really making a lot of progress with a definition like that. I would like to be able to tell you that we don't have that very often in the legal business, but that's not true. Many of our definitions are circular. But before you feel too bad about the legal profession, um, that's common everywhere. Um, if you were to go to a dictionary and look up the word red, I promise you the definition in the dictionary would be much more difficult to understand than the word red. Um, because there are certain words that are so basic to a language or so basic to a field of study that you really can't define it because all the words you would use to describe your word are more complicated and are diff more difficult to understand than that initial word. And so the way little kids learn red is their moms and dads show them red stuff and say, look, this is red. And eventually the kid figures that, oh, they're talking about the color. Now I've got it. And of course, red can be lots of different shades from, you know, a pink to a maroon, uh, to a crimson, and so there are all kinds of different shades there, and yet on some level we understand that all those shades are kind of reddish. Well, that's what we do with definitions um, in a legal business. The term employee is so basic that it's pretty darn hard to define. So I'm not gonna defend this definition and say, commit this to memory. I'm just letting you know this is something you will see sometimes in employment laws. Um, they will say, well, we've got to define our terms, and most statutes do define terms, um, but the definition they provide really doesn't take you very far down the road. Another problem with this definition of employee is that it also includes independent contracts, independent contractors, because an independent contractor is also an individual who is performing labor for um, another person. So really, an independent contractor pretty much fits this definition as well. So for this reason, this definition is a little bit weak, but I'm just letting you know, you're gonna see this definition in statute. So we haven't made a lot of progress, but let's look at another term, master and servant. Now, if you're like me, when you hear this term, you think, gosh, that's a really old fashioned term to use. If I were to go to my place of employment and my boss were to refer to me as a servant and would insist that I call him or her a master, I quit. <laughs> I would not like that one little bit. In addition, these terms are fraught with uh, some very unfortunate facts in American history where these terms were connected to slavery. Um, but the history of these terms actually long predates the existence of the United States and applies outside of a slavery type of context. So these terms we use in the law um, aren't directly connected. In fact, these terms existed and slave owners borrowed these terms, in fact, misused these terms, honestly, to apply in a context that these terms actually don't work. So we're not talking about slavery here we're talking about a term that existed long before slavery. And while we don't use these terms every day in the legal biz, these are important historical words. When you look at cases from a significant time ago, they will use the terms master and servant. And what they mean is employer and employee. Obviously master is the employer and servant is the employee. Here is a little um, excerpt from the uh, restatement of agency. Let me pause here and talk about what a restatement is. A restatement is a, um, a summary of the law in a particular area. And you can see here it's a summary of the law of agency. And we'll talk about what agency is in a couple minutes. It is not something that is done by the government. It is not a statute. It is something that um, legal scholars get together and say, why don't we put all we know about this topic in one set of volumes? And many times it's you know, 10 or 20 volumes, so it's not, not a thin collection of information. 
And they actually write the restatement as if they were writing a statute. And as you can imagine, restatements are, as far as I know, always based upon the common law. Because if we actually did have a statute in this area, there would be no need to restate it, right? Because we'd just look at the statute. But when you're dealing with common law, you know, there's thousands of cases and it's really hard. It's, it's like a, a puzzle. Uh, you know, I, I imagine that you're doing a jigsaw puzzle and you have a thousand pieces. And each one of the puzzle pieces fits with several other pieces, but it takes a long time to find all the pieces and get them in the right spots. Well, what the restatement does is says, we figured it out. We're the, the well-informed experts in this area, and we know where all the puzzle pieces are, and we know how they fit together, and we're going to put all the pieces together into the jigsaw puzzle, and you can see it. And that way, I mean, you still have to look at the cases, but at least you can, can, can kind of get started, kind of have that big overview of how the pieces fit together. Anyway, this is a restatement file. Even though they're secondary source of law, they're not prepared by the government. And the only time you have primary source of law is when the government does it in their official capacity. A restatement is going to be a secondary source of law, but courts eat these things up. They love restatements. Um, courts routinely cite them, and legal professionals routinely mention them in documents they file with courts. They are highly, highly respected. And so while they're a secondary source of law, they're definitely one of those secondary sources of law that you can and will cite from time to time. Some restatements are more well thought of than others. Um, I would say the agency restatement is, it's, it's not poorly thought of, but it's not one of the ones that is a go-to, oh my gosh, you gotta cite the rest this restatement. It is well regarded, but it is not one of the handful that are highly, highly prized. Okay. You don't need to know, by the way, this number. For the most part in these courses, when you see section numbers like this, especially from restatements, I'm absolutely not gonna ask you to, to know the numbers. Here's a definition of servant. So if you're looking for the definition of servant in this context, this is the one I would encourage you to put in your Quizlet or whatever tool you're going to use. So, um, a person employed to perform services in the affairs of another, and of course, the other is the master, and who, with respect to the physical conduct of the performance of the services, is subject to the others, again, we're talking about the master here, control or right to control. So the first part of this definition, up into this spot, would also apply to independent contractors. An independent contractor is a person employed to perform services in the affairs of another. But this is the part that makes it the employee and not the independent contractor. So the second part about control and right to control are the differences. Now you may wonder, what's the difference between subject to the other's control or right to control? This is an important thing when we're talking about master servant or employee employer because sometimes the employer doesn't actually exert the control he i'm going to use he for the employer just to keep the pronouns straightforward he has the right to control but he doesn't control imagine that i hire somebody to clean my house as she's going to be a maid all the time in my house so she's employed 40 hours with about a huge house and I'm very, very messy. So I need to have a full-time staff person to do this. She's an expert. She's wonderful at her job. She knows exactly how to clean. She knows what products to use. She knows, you know, this day is the day I clean this room and this is the right way of doing it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm delighted with her work and I have no idea what products she ought to use or what supplies she needs. I have the right to tell her no, I want you to vacuum on Mondays and Wednesdays, not Tuesdays and Thursdays, but I don't do it. I can, but I choose not to because she's the expert in this field. In that situation, she's still my employee because I have the right to tell her, do the vacuuming on this day, but I don't do it. Um, and so I'm not exercising my control, but I could. Obviously, in a situation where I do give her direct directions, we'll say that her name is Susan. Susan, um, 
I'm having a house party on Thursday evening, so I really want the dining room and the living room and the uh, half bath downstairs to be spick and span. And so please clean those on Thursday. Well, I, I have controlled how she does her work. I've changed the order that she does things. And so under those circumstances, she's clearly my employee. I may never do that or I may do it all the time. It doesn't matter. And under those circumstances, if I have the right to, she is a servant, I am the master. She is an employee, I am the employer. She is not an independent contractor. But let's change the facts. Susan decides that she wants to be a bit of an entrepreneur herself. And she says to me, listen, um, I don't wanna work for you 40 hours a week. I only wanna work for you eight hours a week and I'm gonna take on some other businesses. Okay. She actually has uh, several other customers that she is going to work. She's going to clean my house on Tuesday and she's gonna clean Bob's house on Monday and Teresa's house on Thursday and she's going to clean some small businesses on Friday and Saturday or Friday, Thursday and Friday. Anyway, she has this business going and now she isn't my servant. I'm not her master. She's not my employee. I'm not her employer because this first part's still true. I, uh, she, Susan, is employed to perform services in the affairs of me, um, the, the person who is taking the services. But the second part is no longer true. I can't control how she does her work, or at least if I'm if I want to keep her an independent contractor, I'm not going to. So when she's when she comes to work and starts um, dusting first, and I say, "Oh, I want you to clean the bathrooms first," she uh, quite rightly will say, "Well, no. the The way that I'm the professional here, I'm the person who is an expert in how to do these tasks and." the best way to do them is to do the dusting first and then to do bathrooms later on. Um, I shouldn't be telling her how to do that work. I shouldn't be telling her, oh, use this product, not that product, or use this vacuum cleaner, not that vacuum cleaner. She'll bring her own equipment, she'll decide the order and the method that she uses. If I start micromanaging her, if I start saying, okay, I know that you know, you're just coming today to do my, my house, but I really want you to uh, do this task first and do use this cleaning product when you do this task then even though she's just working for me part-time because i am controlling how she does it and or maintaining my right to control her she still remains my servant and i am still the master in other words she's still my employee and i'm still the employer even though she's got five ten twenty other businesses that she manages so you can see this is the important part of the definition when we're trying to separate employee from master and servant. Okay, so um, these terms obviously can apply in any employment contracts. The example I used of um, a, a janitor or a, a maid is um, something we might associate with master and servant more than, than other terms. I have this little photo here that's just kind of a medieval example. Obviously, this is the master, and she's actually a woman, and this is the servant. Um, but this, lots of different contexts in which this can happen. But in, in some sense, um, if I were to hire an airplane pilot to uh, work for me exclusively, I would be his master or her master, and he or she would be my servant. If I were to hire a, an accountant, um, I am the master, the accountant is the servant in this context. So it, it's not tied, even though we think of this as a medieval term, and so we're thinking about uh, this, more, this picture more than maybe other pictures. It can, these terms would legally apply in very modern industries as well. Okay, now let's talk about principal and agent. The first thing I wanna point out is that we're looking at the word principal. The way I distinguish this word from this word is that principal has the word al in it, right? And al is a name, right? So when we're talking about a principal in this situation, um, we're talking about a human being. 
um, somebody who could be named Al, or if you want to make it Alice, you could make it Alice if you want to. Um, a principal um, with the LE ending is a guiding concept, um, a, uh, a not a human being. So when we use the term principal, we're thinking about um, Al, the boss, so to speak. Um, and of course we have agent and the way that I think about agent again is going to be, I think about Aggie, which is it's an abbreviation. If you're not familiar with the name, it's an abbreviation for the name Agnes. And Aggie is our agent. And we call this relationship between Aggie and Alice an agency relationship. And you can see in the word agent, you start out with agent, you take off the T and you add C, Y, and you have the name of this relationship. So agency is um, in contrast to the master-servant relationship. Because in agency, we have an, a, an, an independent person. We, um, we don't uh, think about this person. This is not completely mesh up with independent contractor, but um, this is a broader term. So if we think about it like this, when we think about agency, this is going to include employment relationships, like master servant. Again, employment relationships are just the same thing as master servant. They're synonyms. And the independent contractor situation. I'm going to get rid of that because it gets it to be a little bit hard to see. Okay. So, um, in an agency relationship, one person, Aggie, the agent, acts on behalf of another. And this is especially important when you're talking about corporations. Um, we oftentimes will talk about, you know, Exxon is doing this, or McDonald's is doing that, or Amazon is doing that. But the reality is, a corporation can't do anything. It's a legal fiction. It doesn't have arms. It doesn't have a brain. It doesn't have hands or legs. It's people who work for Amazon, who make decisions and who communicate those decisions. It's people who work for McDonald's or Exxon or whatever the entity is. Because the only way that Amazon can ever do anything is if a human being associated with Amazon makes the decision and actually does that action. If I order from Amazon and the package arrives on my front stoop, Amazon, the corporate entity, didn't do it. There were probably dozens of workers for Amazon who, you know, processed the order, identified the package, packed it up in the box, put it on the uh, UPS uh, vehicle, and of course the UPS becomes an agent of Amazon if I'm using if the Amazon is using UPS for this, and then in UPS's supply chain. Lots of different UPS employees, because of course UPS is also a corporate fiction. They are touching it. It's going from one location to another, to this airplane, to this truck. And eventually there's a delivery person who delivers it to my front stoop. I mean, that package that I got was probably touched by dozens of people. And they were all agents, in some sense, of Amazon. So Amazon, the corporation, didn't do anything but its agents did a lot of stuff for it. And that's what we mean when we're talking about an agent. And here's a definition. The agent is the party for whom the, um, the actor is called the agent. So the agent is the person who acts on behalf of the other. So this could be your definition if you're looking to do your uh, Quizlet. Um, this could be the definition you use, and you might want to put a parenthesis principle here so it's clear how these are connected. One thing as you're working on memory palaces and things like that in this course 
is when you have pairs of words, either that are synonyms or antonyms, or that are very closely connected, if you pair those up in your definition, um, that really helps you get the memory juices flowing and also connecting it to this organizing principle word. So these three uh, terms, as you're thinking about memorizing it, keep, keeping them connected to each other will be very helpful. And then here's our definition for principle. The party for whom the agent acts and from whom the agent derives authority to act. That is the principle, so this definition here. Now, you may be familiar with this term principle, our, our principle, uh, from the context of a school. Uh, if you, if you uh, have children in, say, elementary school, there's going to be a principle there. Well, in that situation, the principal has agents. Who are his or her agents? The teachers. And so um, the, uh, the principal hires those teachers and gives those teachers the authority to teach. But ultimately, the principal is responsible for what those teachers do. So you can also think of the example of the principal in a school. Um, so that can be another way of thinking about this. Another way of thinking about the term agent is to think about a real estate agent. Um, we're used to that term uh, to refer to somebody who is employed by somebody who is trying to sell a house or perhaps trying to buy a house. And um, that person, it, this is a special category of agent. And if you think about it, um, the real estate agent for the homeowner is um, acting on behalf of the homeowner. Uh, before they're a real estate agents, let's say I see a house that with a sign out front, we're trying to sell this house. Well, I would have to knock on the door or call them up and say, hey, I want to see your house. So we'd have to arrange a time that would be convenient. And then, of course, he doesn't know me, so he's going to want to stay, stick around because maybe I'm going to be stealing from him. And so it becomes a much more cumbersome transaction. But once a real estate agents, who have to be bonded, obviously, um, are uh, in the loop, then you can put those lock boxes on the door and the real estate agent just calls up and makes all the arrangements. And from the home shopper's perspective, it's a lot more uh, uh, smooth process to go ahead and see all these different houses. Much less legwork is required. So the agent is working for the house shopper uh, by performing those tasks that otherwise the house shopper would have to do, and also performing some tasks for the home seller uh, to do. And so that agent, real estate agent, it absolutely meets the definition of the agent. The only issue is who is the principal? And this is an interesting point because um, in some senses, the principal is the homeowner. Because after all, if the agent has been retained by the house shopper, um, he will say that the agent is a man for the sake of this example. The real estate agent is also the principal, excuse me, also the agent for the other principal, for the um, home seller, because he calls the home seller and tells the home seller, hey, I want to show your house on estate. And he enters the home by, by using the the lockbox to, to get into the home. And so obviously that's not something that the house shopper is able to approve. Um, but he's also functioning for the house shopper because he's uh, listening to what the house shopper wants. The house shopper says, I want um, a three bedroom house in Prosper, one story on at least a quarter acre lot. Well, then the real estate agent goes to the MLS listings and finds properties that has those components and then sets up appointments. So he is acting on behalf of the house shopper. It can become quite complicated though to figure out why the real estate agent is, uh, to have two masters, so to speak, to have two principals, uh, especially when in some sense they are, um, there's some tension because obviously um, the, the, the house seller wants to maximize his price, the house buyer wants to minimize the price. And so an uh, agency in this situation can become quite complex. But you can see how the, the real estate agent is an agent um, in this situation. So 
Let's think about a situation where a real estate agent goes beyond his, not a real estate agent, any agent goes beyond his authority. Let's consider this example. Uh, we'll say that Bob works for Bullseye, uh, uh, a, uh, a grocery store slash department store combination. And um, his job is to uh, uh, cash people or to uh, complete the transactions at the end. He's the cashier. Well, apparently, Claude customer comes up, puts all of his items that he wants to buy on the little conveyor belt. And um, for whatever reason, Bob's having a bad day, and Claude says something uh, sparky to him, and Bob just hauls off and punches Claude in the nose. Um, Bob wasn't supposed to do that. Nobody at Bullseye told Bob, hey, Bob, you know what? If one of your customers is a little sparky with you, not so polite, go ahead and punch him. Nobody, I promise you, said that to, to Bob. And in fact, probably Bob was told, uh, hey, let's not punch our customers. Let's not actually do anything harmful to our customers. Um, I'm sure that was probably part of the training, or at least it was an implied part of the training. And so Bob knew he wasn't supposed to punch Claude, and yet he did it anyway. So he acted beyond the authority that his principal gave him. Uh, let's think about the real estate example. Let's say that I am the house shopper, and I've looked at a house, and I've decided I want to buy it. Um, there, the, the pr current price listing is $300,000. I don't think it's worth that, or maybe I don't have that much money. And so I say, listen, um, agent, I am willing to pay $250,000 for this house. That's my max. So you need to go tell the homeowner that I am willing to buy it for two hundred fifty. dollars If you won't agree to that, then we, we won't buy that house. The agent then goes to the, to the homeowner and says, my client is willing to buy it for $270,000. The homeowner goes, okay, sounds good. Yeah, I'll, I'll sell it for two seventy. I need to move on, and, and I know this is for three hundred, but um, this is this is a reasonable price for me. Uh, the agent goes back and goes, "Okay, yay, good news! I was able to 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 arrange for you to buy the house. It's a done deal." Bad news is though, I sold it for two seventy. The house shopper was like, "But I told you my max was two fifty. I don't have twenty thousand more dollars." So you see, in that case, the real estate agent exerted her authority or his authority, just like Bob exerted his authority when he punched Claude in the nose. The thing is, though, that the house seller didn't know the limit of, of the agent's authority. And Claude, I mean, Claude knew that Bob was supposed to punch him in the nose, but Claude went to this cashier because he understood that this cashier was going to complete his transaction on behalf of Bullseye. And so he was trusting in Bullseye's judgment to find a competent, safe cashier to transact this, this, this transaction. And so in both situations, the house shopper is the principal and Bullseye is the principal. And guess what? They're both on the hook when their agent messes up. They can't successfully say, but I didn't tell Bob to punch Claude in the nose, or I didn't tell the real estate agent to um, uh, negotiate a contract for 270. They're stuck with the bad decisions of the agent because the agent is basically taking the position of the principal, replacing himself with that principal, replacing the principal with himself. So the principal is still going to be liable to any loss that that third party, be it Claude the customer or the home seller, um, experiences as a result of that. So um, it, Claude can sue Bob, obviously, for the punch in the nose, but he can also sue Bullseye, the principal, for Claude's punch in the nose. The home seller can certainly sue um, the real estate agent, potentially, for that $270,000 contract. But he can also sue the home sell, the, the um, home buyer, the potential home buyer, for that loss. For this reason, you want to pick agents that you trust.
if, that are going to uh, follow the guidance that you've given and that are going to be able to make wise choices. It's a pretty big deal picking your agent, whether the agent is an independent contractor or is a um, employee. We'll talk more about responding at Superior in a future lecture. Um, thank you for your attention and I hope that you have a wonderful day.